All right, we'll go ahead and get started, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our November installment of our Learning Our Landscape presentation series. Uh, the North Olympic History Center is proud to partner with the Jamestown Skalm Tribe. And the History Center acknowledges that we do our work on the lands of the first peoples of this area, the Klallam, Macaw, Quileute, and Ho River tribes. We recognize the rich and important history of the tribal nations in Klallam County and commit our work to this land acknowledgement to work together collectively to help preserve and share their history. Uh, I'm thrilled today to be joined by Steve Hoff, who's a um, retired county engineer, a uh, local railroad expert, and apparently ex Gandhi dancer, which I actually had to Google to figure out exactly what that was. Um, and I wanna put in a quick plug, cause Steve's gonna be talking about the Spruce Production Railroad today. And we just ordered a fourth printing of Steve's book, the Spruce Production Division in Qualam County, the quest for aircraft spruce during World War I. Uh, we now have copies for the, of these for sale here at the History Center. Um, if you're interested in getting some cool holiday gifts for someone, lots of really cool historic photos, maps, um, other materials inside. So if you're interested in those, please let me know. And without further ado, I will welcome Steve and turn it over to him. Welcome, Steve. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, let's get started. Uh, a couple of, of disclaimers. Uh, this per, this uh, presentation uh, has been given here in the county for about 40 years, and it has grown significantly over that time period. So the full-blown uh, version of it is is uh, now over two hours. Um, and and David uh, wisely uh, thought that this was not the the venue to to have the full blown version. So we have a, a somewhat uh, truncated, uh, abbreviated version that we'll be giving today. Uh, I've left out a lot of the material associated with the biographies of the people who were involved in the in the spruce production uh, division, uh, as well as its impact. Uh, globally uh, actually on the on the uh, uh, timber industry and and uh, it its influence for many years uh, after the the end of the first world war one of the things that i am going to ask of you as participants in this is to uh, basically get out of the 21st century and go back 105 years to the time when this railroad was being built, uh, keeping in mind that we have a, a completely different set of social mores and, and social norms in the 21st century than, than what was going on in, in 1918 when they were actually building this railroad. Uh, remember that we were in the midst of a world war uh, and people were, were being killed literally by the millions in, in Europe. And we were also in the midst of, of a tremendous pandemic uh, that made COVID uh, look like a walk in the park. The Spanish flu of 1917, 18, 19 um, had probably between 50 and 80 million uh, fatalities and uh, throughout the, the world. And, and the reason for the disparity in the number is we simply didn't have reporting capabilities uh, for things like South America, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and, and uh, portions of, of South Asia. Suffice it to say that there were some major problems going on. And, and so uh, the, the way we looked at doing things in those days was, was a lot different than, than we uh, look nowadays. Um, oh my, this is not good. No, I'll try. There we go. David saves the day. Um, the First World War, starting in, in the uh, uh, mid-teens in, in Europe, uh, we need to remember that we were only 
uh, just a few years into the infancy of, of aircraft. Uh, basically, it was about uh, 10 to 12 years uh, after the the advent of powered flight uh, that that the World War I started in in Europe. Um, the Europeans were were far ahead of the Americans in in aircraft technology at that point and and even our aces uh, such as Eddie Rickenbacker, uh, flew the aircraft that's that's pictured here, the SPAD, which was of French design and largely of, of French uh, construction. Uh, our second most famous ace um, was Snoopy Dog, of course, and and uh, they flew the the Sopwith Camel, which was both British design and British manufacture. Uh, the aircraft construction during that time period, of course, was, was largely wood and wire, uh, all covered with, with aircraft linen, and then uh, painted with, with a, a paint called dope uh, to stiffen it up a bit. Uh, this aircraft uh, that's pictured here is a, is a reconstruction of a, uh, an American-built training plane, the Curtis Jenny. Uh, the JN-4, and, and uh, this was one of the few aircraft that was built in the United States uh, during the First World War and, and was uh, essentially a, 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 a training and reconnaissance aircraft. It was, it was said that uh, by one of the early pilots that if you could fly a Jenny, you could fly absolutely anything because it was not an easy aircraft to fly. After the war, however, it it uh, was sold uh, to many private individuals and became the the uh, staple of of the barnstormers of the 1920s. And and uh, as they moved from performance to performance, uh, they did so generally in a in a Curtis Jenny. The aircraft uh, that is behind this one, that large gray uh, silver gray aircraft, is also a wooden airplane. Uh, it is the HK-1 flying boat uh, that was built during the Second World War by Howard Hughes and Henry Kaiser um, to, to show that they could build a transport aircraft largely out of, out of wood. It is, uh, contains almost no spruce, despite the, the fact that it is named Spruce Goose, uh, and it is, is more of a Masonite-type uh, aircraft. Um, it is extremely large. If the middle of the hull was put on the 50-yard line of a football field, the wingtips would be in both end zones. And if Wilbur and Orville had taken off from one wingtip on their original flight, it would have taken three of their original powered flights to get to the other wingtip. It's an immense aircraft. Now, the, the wood of, of choice for, for building these airplanes during the First World War uh, was Sitka spruce. And, and there are several reasons why Sitka spruce was so popular for aircraft building, uh, one of which is its weight. One of the things to remember about the airplanes that were being built during the First World War is that they were almost all tremendously underpowered. The vast majority of, of the engines that were in use, at least during the early years of the war, were under 100 horsepower. And so weight was a very important consideration in, in these aircraft. And spruce is a much lighter wood than either hemlock or, or fir, or even pine for that matter. When, when dried, uh, spruce is significantly uh, lighter. It also has uh, very long fibers. And the, the long fiber allowed uh, flexing, uh, it had very good strength uh, for its weight, and it also had the the unique capability of if you actually shot it with with a relatively modest caliber weapon, uh, the the fibers would simply separate and allow the bullet either to pass through or to lodge uh, within the the structure. Uh, unlike fir or hemlock, which would uh, shatter. And, and then cause structural failure in the, in the aircraft. Uh, the spruce species that was most popular was the Sitka spruce, 
which is found on the uh, western coast of the United States from about the California Oregon border, uh, clear on up to the Alaska Panhandle. Uh, it is generally found in, in large quantities west of the coastal range uh, and, and uh, is, is uh, um, there are very large uh, Sitka spruce in, in those areas which are suitable for aircraft spruce. Now, you can't simply go out and find a spruce tree and cut it down and cut it into uh, dimensional pieces and call it aircraft spruce. There are a number of, of requirements uh, for aircraft spruce, one of which is that for about a 20 to 25 foot length of, of uh, timber, you can only have about a half of an inch of twist to it. And this is to ensure that you have a very, very uniform uh, strength throughout the entire piece of wood. And, and that keeps the wings from, from twisting an aircraft and such. It also has to be not free. Uh, this is all has to be clear lumber. And so what you had to have was, was an extremely large uh, tree that was in an area where the winds did not cause any major twists in the, in the timber. One of the largest uh, stands of timber, of spruce timber that, that uh, was available at that point was in Western Clallam County. And it was located in, in the Beaver, uh, Dickey, Hoko area, uh, Western Clallam County. Uh, the, the issue primarily at that point was that Western Clallam County was, it was kind of the middle of nowhere. Uh, there were no adequate roads uh, really west of uh, Port Angeles at that point. There, there were, in fact, some wagon roads, uh, but they were all pretty bad and would have been totally unsuitable for, for carrying uh, the amount of spruce that, that they anticipated were going to be necessary to, to uh, supply the, uh, the needs of the Allies uh, for construction of aircraft. Uh, so it was decided relatively early on in the going, about May or June of 1918, uh, that a railroad would have to be built to these stands. And the railroad would, would start out someplace around Joyce, uh, which was on the, uh, at that point, on the uh, Milwaukee line that ran from Port Angeles out to Deep Creek, uh, and and then proceed along the north line of, of Lake Se uh, Crescent and out through the Salduck Valley to a uh, pre-cut up plant that would be located at Beaver, and then a 70 mile loop of railroad in the Dickey and Hoko basins, which would actually supply the, the logs to the, the initial cut up plant at, at Beaver. A sawmill would also be built in Port Angeles uh, to cut these into proper dimension timber, uh, largely for export to our allies, but also to a growing aircraft industry that was occurring in the United States. Uh, this is what they were after. Uh, this in military parlance is, is a spruce, one each, and, and you can see down here in the corner, uh, this is a man standing here. And if we give him even a modest uh, five foot nine uh, height, you can see that this tree uh, was probably uh, on the order of 10 to 11 feet in diameter uh, above the, the uh, swell of the, of the butt. It also was probably 100 to 120 feet to the first significant branch on it. So that was all virtually clear lumber uh, once they, they cut it down. Now, moving a tree of, of this size in, in 1918 was no small task. And, and initially, uh, the trees were, were in fact felled and then split or ribbed. Um, and unfortunately, that that practice to, to, to split them down 
resulted in a significant loss of, of aircraft grade timber, uh, lumber, uh, cut out of, of the trees. And, and it was a practice that, that as soon as they got a railroad into an area, uh, they eliminated it because you could put a 10 or 11 foot uh, diameter tree in one piece on, on a rail car. It, it's worth mentioning that the Spruce Division, while the the 36 mile uh, mainline railroad and the 70 mile uh, projected logging railroad in Clallam County was was by far the most uh, ambitious of the of the uh, railroads. Uh, there were, in fact, 13 railroads uh, built by the Spruce Division, built or operated by the Spruce Division, uh, from southern Oregon all the way up to, to Clallam County in the north. The, the first uh, job after, after surveying the railroad and, and the design was, was to clear it. And, and uh, so one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that we have no uh, ball, uh, no faller bunchers, uh, and and uh, no modern logging equipment. All of this was done uh, with uh, generally hand saws and axes, uh, and they had to clear a right of way sufficient in width to to construct a railroad. This photograph was was taken in the in the Saldot Valley, and and uh, one of the things that I like to point out about this is you'll notice that all of the timber that has been dropped at this point is probably no larger than three or four feet in diameter. Now, this is in fact a virgin forest. Uh, it had not been logged before, but the trees are relatively uh, small. And, and the reason for that has, is, is at least twofold. Um, there were unrestricted fires uh, in this area uh, for, for centuries. And so once uh, a forest was established, it, it, if the lightning started a, uh, a fire, it would burn through the entire area and, and the forest would have to start over again. Also, the, the meandering of the Salduck River uh, went basically from, from hill to hill on, on opposite sides. And, and as it moved back and forth over geologic time, uh, it destroyed the trees. Uh, knocked them all down, and and uh, then the forest again had to start. So not all virgin forests have tremendous sized trees. Some of them are are relatively modest in their overall size. Another thing to to remember about 105 years ago is that uh, there were no D8 or D9 caterpillars or uh, tractors, uh, nor were there big dump trucks. Uh, and a tremendous amount of the work uh, that was done on this 36 mile railroad uh, was done by hand. Now, if you look at this picture closely, you'll notice that the, the uh, fellows are, are all standing in a cut that is about five or six feet deep. And it is probably uh, 25, 24, 25 feet in, in width. And that means then that for every yard that they they uh, uh, moved down this cut, they were probably moving between 15 and 20 cubic yards of dirt. And it was all being done with pickaxes, shovels, and, and the wheelbarrows that you see. Virtually all of it was being done by hand. Uh, because of the, the expediency of this construction project, uh, there were contractors and members of the Spruce Division who were working all along the length of the 36 miles of a uh, railroad from uh, what was later called Disk Junction uh, out to Lake Pleasant. Um, and, and in many cases, the only tools that they could get in to an area were in fact uh, hand tools and, and a tremendous amount of the work was was done by individuals by hand. You also notice that the, in this picture is predominantly uh, military personnel. You can tell by the, the, uh, the campaign hats that they're wearing. But in other photographs, you will also see 
uh, civilian personnel and and uh, the spruce division, the military personnel worked with the civilian personnel, the contractors uh, people all through this in, entire operation. Now out in the Saldock Valley, uh, they were very fortunate because the the land was relatively flat, and and uh, it was was also uh, a, a gravel, uh, not particularly hard rock. Uh, although you can see a few donikers here in the in the foreground, but basically it was a case of just uh, stumping the area, take the stumps out with, with either stump pulling machines or, or with uh, powder and, and then smooth it and move the little humps uh, that you had into the little hollows that you inevitably would find. And, and uh, uh, this was done uh, with a whole series of these dump wagons. Um, the the wagons would would hold anywhere from a yard to two yards and and uh, were horse or mule hauled uh, from the place where they were the borrow pit if you will where they were getting the material to where they needed it in in a hollow or um, in a valley. Um, I was fortunate to stumble on an example of the wagons that were were used. Uh, this one happens to be in Michigan and it's been fully restored. Um, and this was this is what you saw in the previous picture in in the Saldot Valley. Uh, to to load the wagon, there were a couple of different ways that they did it. Uh, one was by hand, in which case you would shovel uh, about a yard to two yards of material shoulder high to throw it over the edge. Uh, into the wagon, and then the wagon would take off, and the teamster uh, could then pull a lever, and the bottom opened on the wagon, and and would would lay a windrow as the horses moved the wagon forward. The other method of of filling these uh, involved a a scraper with an elevator, and this was again horse drawn, and what would happen is the wagon would pull up. Uh, beside this uh, this scraper, and they would move forward in unison, and a series of belts and pulleys then would elevate the the dirt uh, onto a conveyor belt and then dump it into the the wagon. We have one uh, documented incident, however, where the the teamster uh, was a little bit delayed and and uh, it didn't move fast enough, and and the conveyor wound up. Uh, dumping the dirt on on top of the horses. Uh, the equines did not particularly appreciate this and immediately sped up just far enough so that the conveyor then dumped the dirt on top of the teamster. Uh, after which uh, the teamster then moved a little bit farther forward, put the, the dirt where it belonged in the wagon, and uh, rumor has it he never made that mistake again. Uh, this is definitely a case of where the equines were smarter than the Teamster was. Now, there were a few places uh, in the construction where you could, in fact, get a steam shovel in. And the steam shovels in, in the World War I era were, were a pretty prim primitive affair. Uh, as you can see in, in this photograph, they, they have wheels, not, not tracks. And, and this particular steam shovel is, is sitting on a set of mats, um, which are made up of, of generally wood and canvas, uh, so that it won't sink out of sight in the, in the mud. Um, this particular one is probably up uh, between Disc and, and the Liar River Canyon and, and would lift anywhere from a half yard to a yard uh, with each uh, swing. You'll also notice that, that there are two sets of these dump cars on the little tram road that they use to, to move the dirt. Uh, the, the steam shovel would, would fill the two uh, cars that are facing in this direction, and then the horse and their teamster would, would move it off to wherever it was being dumped and dump the cars. And at the same time, the two cars that are shown in the background there would be moved down to the steam shovel 
uh, and would would uh, be filled while the other ones were dumping. And this way, they could make far better utilization of, of the steam shovel. Now, because the a, a true steam driven shovel is is uh, not uh, an instant start sort of a thing. Uh, at night, they would leave the the boiler. Uh, they would stoke the fire up and and bank it in such a way that that uh, it would keep the boiler warm all night and generally a little bit of steam uh, on the boiler so that that the next morning they could immediately begin digging. Uh, with this shovel, we believe uh, one night uh, some uh, kids from the uh, from the area actually got onto the steam shovel. And there was still sufficient steam to to move it, and so they had a rather large play toy for the evening. Uh, after that, uh, there were guards posted on on most of the steam shovels to prevent the children from playing with their uh, rather large toys. When they finally got to the the step of laying railroad. Uh, the army had procured a couple of rail uh, laying machines, and this is what we have shown in this photograph. Uh, these basically did nothing more than move the, the ties and the rail forward from cars that were located between the, the rail layer and the locomotive there. Uh, forward and and then the the men would take the ties one at a time, one one fell on each end of the tie, move them forward and set them down in place. Then a rail would be brought forward and then they could begin the spiking of the of the rails to to uh, actually lay the railroad. You'll notice at the end of the boom there is a a flag, uh, an American flag that is has been been put up there. Uh, you'll see this in many of the photographs. There, there was a tremendous amount of patriotism uh, associated with the with the Spruce Division. Uh, part of it because the military was running the whole show, and 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 part of it uh, was because that's the way the country felt uh, in 1918, as we were engaged in in the uh, war in Europe. Uh, this is a, a photograph where you can see there's a combination of military campaign hats as well as uh, Phils and Fedoras, uh, who were probably the civilian uh, contractors who were involved in, in the building of the railroad. Most of the heavy work was actually done by uh, civilian contractors. There were dozens of them along the, the length of, uh, of the railroad, as well as uh, in the in the woods, uh, grading the the uh, proposed logging lines, uh, and they were all uh, coordinated by a an engineering company called Seams Carry HS Kerbaugh Corporation. Um, this was a a company that was hired by the Spruce Division to keep track of all of the work that was being done simultaneously along this 36 miles of, of railroad. When they actually got to the, the point at which they were spiking the, the rails down, um, and this is what was occurring in, in this photograph. The, the gentleman here in the, in the foreground on the, on the left uh, are spiking about every fifth or sixth tie. Uh, to get it into gauge. And then the fellows uh, who are, are behind here are spiking each and every tie. Uh, it was all done by hand. Uh, you can see a fellow here with a, with a spike mall. He's setting a, a spike. This gentleman uh, is, is what we call nipping the tie. He had a bar that was under the end of the tie and was holding it up so that that uh, when the, the spike was struck by the spike mall, it would go into the tie and the, and the tie would not bounce. Uh, there were generally two men. One would set it and then two men would actually drive it here. And then the, the other rail was uh, gauged to the first rail to make sure it was the right distance for it. And then this crew would then uh, drive it home. Occasionally, 
um, when you were laying track in this particular case, this was a passing siding, probably near the top of a Fairholm Hill. Um, you would have to actually cut the, the rail to make it fit in between previously laid uh, pieces of, of uh, railroad steel. And when you did that, uh, it was done by, by hand with basically what was no more than a, a large hacksaw on steroids. And, and uh, uh, they would by hand cut through the rail. And, and you did that because when you use a torch uh, on railroad rail, it changes the metallurgy and becomes very, very brittle and will break under, under uh, the pounding that the, the trains give it. So, so you cut it with a, with a hacksaw and then you have to affix it to the adjacent piece of rail. And the way you do that is you drill some holes in it so that the angle bars uh, can be bolted on either side of the, of the rail to hold it to the, the other piece of track. Uh, these two fellows here on, on the right of the photograph um, are, are in fact uh, drilling a hole in, in the rail and, and that is being done with a manual drill. The drill is, is something, uh, it's kind of like a, a bicycle handle on the top and you simply uh, move the handles around and through a set of gears, it pushes the, the drill bit through the rail. A friend of mine down in Squim uh, has one of these, and, and one day we decided that we would drill a hole in a piece of rail just to find out what it was like, because we obviously grew up in the era when, when uh, it was all done with power tools. And so we went out and found a piece of rail and, and hooked up the, the drill and got a nice sharp drill bit and immediately started pumping away on this, this drill. And, and I can assure you that it was a great deal of fun uh, for about 30 seconds, uh, after which it was absolute drudgery. And, and after switching off a number of times, um, we, we finally looked at the rail and noticed that we had put a, a rather small dimple in it and could not imagine uh, actually having to, to uh, make it all the way through so that you could put a bolt through this. Uh, a tremendous amount of work. The rail that was used on on the railroad was was kind of a curious combination uh, of, of various rails that were obtained uh, throughout the country. Uh, during the First World War, of course, there was a tremendous shortage of, of steel uh, that was uh, suitable for making railroad rails. And the, the Spruce Division had people out from all over the country uh, who were, in fact, uh, looking for rail that was available. Uh, one of the, the scouts found an entire uh, pile of it at the Cambria Steelworks back east. And, and uh, uh, for some reason, nobody, nobody had claimed uh, this rail. As it turned out, uh, the, the rail was, was rolled for the Russian Tsar at that point. And uh, in 1918, of course, he was having some interesting problems, uh, social problems in Russia and was unable to, to take delivery of this rail. Uh, it was obtained by the Spruce Division and they brought it out to, to use on the railroad. Unfortunately, it was, was rolled to a design that was not used commonly in North America, uh, but rather a, a Russian design. And in the areas uh, where it was used on, on this railroad, it, it plagued the railroad clear until it was torn up in, in the early 1950s because none of the, the hardware, the angle bars and such uh, would, fit, um, would fit this Russian rail as, as well as it would, uh, properly fit uh, American rollings. Now, the, one of the major problems, uh, of course, in the design of the railroad was Lake Crescent. And Lake Crescent uh, has a number of places where the, the mountain uh, goes directly into the lake and, and it goes into a lake that has 
very steep sides and is very, very deep so that you cannot readily build a bridge. Uh, to, to find a, a way to build a railroad there, they had to, of course, uh, cut a shelf along the, uh, the side of the, the uh, lake uh, in, the, in the rock itself. Now, if you go out uh, to Lake Crescent Lodge uh, today and, and look across the lake, you will see a view that is uh, very, very similar to, to this. The short tunnel is, is right in this area. And, and you can see in, in this 1918 photograph, uh, the beginnings of a right of way over here, uh, just to the east of the of the main rock uh, coming down there, and and uh, uh, this is just to the uh, east of of where the old ferry uh, landing used to be uh, at uh, Lake Crescent Lodge. Uh, these photographs were taken by H.L. Curtis. Um, who was hired by the uh, United States Army to record the building of, of this. And, and uh, Curtis uh, did most of his photography with an eight by 10 inch uh, camera. And so he was packing these rather large uh, cameras around every time he came out to take photographs of uh, the, the railroad construction. In addition, uh, you have to remember that these are not digital type cameras where you just punch the button and, and, and it'll take three images per second or something like that. Uh, taking a picture in, in 1918 was, was uh, somewhat more difficult in that you, you had to cock the camera, uh, set your apertures and, and such, your uh, apertures and your shutter speed. Uh, you also then had to put uh, a, a sheet of film into the back of the camera and remove the black slide so that it could be exposed. Then you took the picture, re put the black slide uh, back in, and if you had to take another picture in quick succession, you flipped over the film back and recock the camera and pulled the black slide out again. And so it was a, it was a rather involved process to take pictures. Uh, Curtis actually got four photographs of, of this same area uh, after the initial blast where, where uh, thousands of tons of rock were blown off the, the, uh, the side of, of the mountain. Um, in my previous life as county engineer, I, I interfaced with the park a lot. And, and in talking with the, the, uh, the park rangers and, and the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, I, I asked them how long it would take me to get the permits necessary to blow up a, a major portion of Olympic National Park like this. And they indicated it was something like when hell freezes over. Like, they they didn't think it was extremely likely that I, I could ever get permits to do this. Uh, Curtis actually got multiple photographs uh, of this, this explosion and a uh, total of at least four photographs before the wave ultimately hit the, the south shore of the lake. Of course, after the, the big uh, shots uh, occurred, you also had a whole series of, of small explosions, uh, small, small blasts uh, to take out the pieces that didn't properly come off when you when you set off the big the big bangs and and uh, keeping in mind that the section along uh, Lake Crescent was being built by a whole series of of contractors, and these contractors would typically be boated in on on Sunday night and would work then Monday through Saturday and then go out to be re uh, provisioned and 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 just get off the lake uh, on on Saturday evening. Uh, these guys were working uh, out of very small camps. There were one or two of the camps that that because of the the steepness of the slope actually had to be located on barges that were moored to the side of, of the lake uh, until they got an area that was flat enough to actually uh, build the uh, build a camp 
uh, on the shore. Um, once the, the smaller shots were made, of course, uh, because uh, of the fact that everybody was brought in by boat, uh, there was no way to get steam shovels or such in. And, and what you see is, is the removal of a tremendous amount of rock all by hand. Uh, these fellows were, were in there digging with shovels. They would load up their, their tram car, then run it down to a spot where they could dump it uh, generally into the lake uh, to create a, um, uh, a roadbed. On the right-hand side of, of this photograph, uh, unfortunately out of focus, you can see the ferry Storm King, uh, sidewheel ferry, uh, the ferries on, on the lake uh, were were uh, commandeered by the uh, the army, together with a number of launches uh, that they brought in and and tugs to move barges uh, to take uh, materiel from generally the Piedmont area uh, around Log Cabin Resort uh, to Fairholm, uh, where they unloaded them and took them out uh, the wagon road or the the trail. Uh, that went out to the west end of the, the county. Um, these were were almost exclusively used by the military uh, during the, the uh, eight, 1918 time period. Now, I, I like this picture because uh, the guy standing here on, on the right, believe it or not, is, is uh, probably one of the most important people in the, in the photograph. Uh, he's looking for uh, loose rock that may uh, start to move uh, toward the, the crew that is working at the bottom of the hill. Uh, it is interesting to note that there were very, very few uh, serious injuries as a result of the construction of this railroad. Uh, safety was very, very important to the uh, Spruce Division, and they made sure that... that uh, uh, the men were were taken care of very very well on the uh, on the construction. It's also worthy of note that that uh, a significant number of the crew members uh, who were uh, actually part of the Spruce Division uh, were immigrants. They came in from uh, from various locations, and as a result of their their uh, service to the Spruce Division during the construction of this railroad, many of them didn't achieve uh, citizenship in the United States. Uh, there were well over 100 uh, who became citizens uh, as a result of their service in, in uh, Spruce Division. Now, there were a couple of spots on the lake uh, where there it was simply impossible to, to blast a a roadbed out of the uh, out of the rock. Uh, it was too high. The alignment was wrong, and, and this was one of them. And this is uh, the the uh, first tunnel on the lake. Uh, you can just see the uh, beginning of the tunnel here, and you can uh, you can now go through the tunnel on the on the Spruce uh, Railroad Trail. This was the longer of the two tunnels, and and. Uh, both of these tunnels were very expensive to, to build. There was at least one uh, note that they were, because they were built, uh, dug 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, and in very bad conditions because they had to bring everything into the, the tunnel faces um, by boat. They were some of the most expensive rail tunnels on a per foot basis ever, ever dug in the United States to, to this point. Uh, this shows the other end of the, of the longer tunnel. Uh, this is the one closest to Devil's Punch Bowl. And, and uh, uh, the, they had initially anticipated that the tunnels could be unlined. And when they got into the, the rock itself, they found out that it was not as solid as they thought it was. And so they had to uh, bring liners in for the whole thing and, and erect a, wood, a wooden lining uh, on the inside of the tunnel. 
Now, this was uh, uh, typical of, of Curtis or, or his assistants. Uh, he sent somebody up the, up the hill with this 8x10 camera to record uh, the, the uh, tunnel digging uh, from, a, from a high position. And you will notice that there's quite a bit of, of lining material uh, that has been stockpiled here. And as they dug the tunnel, of course, they would put the lining in it. And, and uh, um, so that when they had plunked through all the, all the way, the entire tunnel would be ready uh, to use. Then the waste, of course, would be poured into this area uh, and, and, uh, Initially, in some cases, they would put in a, a trestle and then fill, fill around it. In other cases, they simply created the, the fill if the, if the lake was shallow enough to be able to, to do that. Um, down below, this shows the, the tunnel portal and looking back uh, after they've, they've laid the uh, railroad uh, through the extra rail in here is for the the construction cars uh, that they that they have used to to move the spoils out of the tunnel, um, as well as to move the lining material into the tunnel. This is the second tunnel, the shorter tunnel. Uh, this one, uh, even as a kid, I remember was was always open. Uh, you could walk through it. The the thing that uh, always surprised me was the number of of large rocks that had fallen over the years, and and uh, I always managed to take the path around the the point rather than walking through because they, they just didn't look all that stable to me uh, through the tunnel. Now, now large steam shovels were were used in a, in a couple of places on the uh, on the railroad construction. Uh, this is one that is being brought in from the the Joyce end of, of the railroad and and uh, these were self-powered uh, Bucyrus or Mar Marion shovels, very, very similar, although somewhat smaller than the the shovels that had been used the previous decade in the digging of the Panama Canal. Um, these were brought in and, and uh, were, were self-powered. They had the ability to crawl along. And, and what you're seeing here is that, that these folks are, are, are working with a few pieces of, of railroad rail here that they have uh, laid on some rather makeshift ties and they're holding them together with steel rods to keep them from, from spreading. And, and they will walk the shovel uh, in very, very slowly uh, on this temporary track uh, until they get it to the place uh, where they want to work with it, and, and then they can begin the work. These are, are far too large a piece of equipment to put on a trailer or anything of, of, uh, during that period. And so uh, to move them, you had to move them on their own wheels. Uh, this would have been a very... Uh, ponderous and 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 uh, quite dangerous task because these are are relatively top heavy machines and and uh, if you didn't have them on a secure base they could easily turn turtle. Now this is up in the Liar River Canyon and and uh, what they found was that if you dig out the the bottom of the hill, uh, sometimes the top of the hill comes down and greets you. And that's what's happened in this case. Their, their large shovel has been uh, covered with, with a landslide. In this case, if you look off to the left, you'll notice these would have been the running rails for the finished railroad. And then this rail and the one here uh, to the outside uh, were the rails that were used for the construction train, uh, which was a, a small uh, steam locomotive and several cars uh, where they would pick up the spoils and, and move it to uh, another location. Um, here's another picture of the same accident. And, and what's important to note here is that, that there is no steam shovel or front end loader or anything else to rescue this uh, steam shovel. Uh, 
uh, it would all have to be dug out by hand. And, and we're talking at this point, uh, my estimation is that there's a couple of hundred yards of material that would have to be dug out by hand, put into the little tram car and taken and dumped into the, the Liar River Canyon there. Uh, on the right side of the photograph, this is somewhat interesting uh, in that, that if you look at the, the train tracks that are here, these are the running rails for the main railroad, and this is the construction railroad. There's nothing under the outside of these ties. Um, and if, if we zoom in on it a little bit, you'll notice that, that clearly there is not much holding up the, the construction railroad. Uh, at this point, and, and uh, whoever ran the train on that had more nerve than good sense, uh, because this is a, a rather sketchy affair all the way around. Uh, and this was the locomotive, uh, the small steam locomotive and, and the dump cars uh, in the uh, Liar River Canyon there that were running on, on that railroad. You'll also notice that uh, there's some rather large chunks of rock it, down in in the canyon and and uh, the last time I walked the Liar River Canyon those were still quite visible uh, along the area below the the right of way uh, when they blasted out the shelf for the railroad they simply allowed the the material to go down into the into the Liar River and and uh, how they managed not to plug it up is is entirely beyond me, but the, the river kept flowing through there. And despite the fact that uh, that's where virtually all the spoils from from uh, along the, the shelf there wound up. Now, there were two major bridges uh, on the railroad, uh, both over the Salt Up River. One was just west of uh, Fairholm. Uh, where the railroad swung uh, south from the top of Fairholm Hill, uh, and then across the river and then down flats. The other was located uh, in the what is now the fish hatchery at, at Sappho. And this is the uh, photograph of the approach trestle for the, the bridge uh, at Sappho. Um, again, uh, things were done in a far more primitive fashion than, than what we're used to nowadays. Uh, you can see there's a, a steam uh, pile driver there that's that's driving the the foundation piles that will ultimately hold up the the bridge. It's it's a, a drop hammer type pile driver where you have that large hammer that's near the top of the. Um, the uh, pile driver there and, and uh, you would simply drag it up to the top with a steam donkey that's not visible uh, in this picture and and then release it and it would come down and bounce uh, off the top of the pile driving it into the into the ground. Uh, the inspector there that's standing out on the on the wood is, is uh, watching how the the pile is being driven and will determine uh, what depth to to drive it to? Uh, I can assure you uh, from years of experience that when that hammer hits the the top of the pile, there is a tremendous amount of vibration, and and he would have been holding on for dear life uh, so that he didn't get knocked off of that and and into the river. Uh, it would have been a rather precarious position all the way around. The the bridge uh, the bridges that they erected uh, on the on the Saldock were 150 foot uh, through how trusses. Uh, and this is a, a photograph of the of the one at uh, near Sappho, uh, virtually identical to the the bridge that is over the Dungeon Ass at the at the River Center, um, just west of uh, Squim. Uh, the Howe Truss was a, uh, a very, very popular bridge from its inception uh, in, in the 1830s or 40s, um, clear until uh, the 1920s, uh, was used for a, uh, um, many, many railroad and, and road bridges. Um, it's, an, it's a kind of a modular design in that you can, each panel 
uh, can be removed or added to, to get them up to around 160, 170 foot, uh, were the longest of the uh, how trusses. Uh, they were also delivered to the site as, as a kit. Uh, they came in uh, as all pre-cut pieces and uh, the, the people who were building the bridge uh, built a false work uh, underneath them and then started laying the pieces on and, and bolting them all together. Uh, and all of the, all of the pieces were, were pre-cut so that there was very little cutting or drilling uh, that had to be done on site. It was all basically uh, all done in, in factories uh, and then shipped out to the site. Another advantage of the, uh, the Howe Trust Bridge is that while this is a 150 foot span, uh, the longest piece of wood in it was probably about 80 to 85 feet um, because of the way it bolts together uh, and such, you can you can achieve very long spans with with timber or lumber that is actually significantly smaller than the than the length of the bridge. In addition to to the bridges, uh, there were several trestles uh, on the uh, on the line. Some of which were rather significant. Uh, this one is is just west of uh, Fairholm. Um, and and kind of west of the Saldock Hot Springs uh, road, the road that you see underneath the trestle here would have been 101 in, in 1918. Uh, as you can see, it's not much of a road at this point uh, in history. And and uh, this bridge uh, in later years was was all filled in. And uh, now there's there's very little evidence that it that uh, it existed at any point. Now again, keeping in mind that this was 1918, uh, and all of the, the the railroad trains at that point were powered by steam locomotives, uh, at least in the Western United States. Uh, you had to also provide for water tanks and, and fuel bunkers uh, along the railroad. Uh, this involved having to secure water rights, finding a dependable uh, source of, of water, and then constructing a, a water tank uh, so that the locomotives could in fact draw water periodically uh, on their, their haul from uh, Port Angeles or from DISC uh, out to Lake Pleasant. You'll also notice that that in this photograph there are dozens and dozens of, of poles and, and this was for the telegraph and telephone line that paralleled the railroad because they anticipated that, that there might be more than a dozen trains a day utilizing this uh, railroad. And because of that, there would be logical passes that had to be made with the empties going out west and the loads coming uh, coming eastbound. And, and because of this, you had to have dispatching capabilities to ensure that that uh, uh, you didn't have collisions or, or that you were holding up trains that needed to, to uh, move through the railroad. And so in addition to the the railroad, and, and in addition to the fueling and watering capacity uh, that had to be created, you also had to have a, uh, a telephone and telegraph line that paralleled the entire railroad and its whole distance. Now, this is uh, a photograph of, of the Lyre River Canyon. Um, it's actually a photograph of the photographer. Uh, this is Achel Curtis, and, and he was... Uh, uh, assigned this uh, railway motor car uh, that he could uh, use to to carry his cameras uh, and film to any point on the on the completed railroad. Uh, to the left, you can see the amount of debris that has accumulated along the Liar River, the, the large rock that had been blasted off of the the shelf. Um, this the motor car that Curtis had is uh, 
of a type that uh, has no uh, clutch in it. Uh, and to start it, you would run along behind it and flip the uh, buzz coil. They used a buzz coil very similar to a Model T. Uh, and then the cylinder would, or the piston would fire uh, and, and away you went. Um, the only problem was that if you didn't jump on in time, um, the speeder would leave without you. Uh, and, and they typically had enough fuel to go 50 or 60 miles uh, until they ran out of gas. And it would be somewhat embarrassing to watch your cameras disappearing around the next curve, uh, knowing that it wasn't going to stop for a very, very long time. Because of the, the delay in getting uh, locomotives and such during the First World War, and any type of rail equipment was was at a premium during that time period. Uh, the Spruce Division leased uh, all of their motive power from the uh, Milwaukee. And this locomotive, while slightly modified to allow for uh, supplying steam to things like the the rail uh, layer, uh, is is what built the entire railroad. There were several of these that were, in fact, uh, leased uh, from the Milwaukee to the the uh, Spruce Division for the construction of, of the railroad. Uh, this was a place called Disc Junction. And while we're not talking about the biographies of the people involved, the head of the Spruce Production Division was Colonel Rice Disc, uh, later uh, uh, Brevet uh, General as well. And, and uh, the junction between the Milwaukee Road and the Spruce Division was about two miles west of, uh, of Joyce. The track on the right is the Milwaukee Road that ran from Port Angeles uh, all the way out to Twin Rivers, uh, where it terminated in the Puget Sound Mill and Timber logging uh, railroads. And the three tracks on the left are the interchange yard between the Milwaukee and the Spruce Division. Uh, the track where the motor car and, and pump car are sitting, it was the main line. And the other two were tracks. Uh, one presumably could, could contain empty cars, the other uh, loaded cars and, and for trains that were interchanging there rather than running all the way through. Seems Kerry Kerbaugh uh, wanted to have movable camps uh, for their personnel, uh, as well as as uh, also for the the uh, logging uh, people, when they finally got to the uh, the logging lines, which were northwest of, of Beaver, uh, and so they contracted with a company in in Ballard uh, to provide these rail camp cars. Um, they were provided in kit form. Uh, the company um, sent over uh, a, a kit for the car that was all, all uh, pre-cut, and you would erect it on your own flat car. Uh, seems Kerry uh, contacted the Milwaukee and, and found a bunch of old flat cars that were available and purchased those, and then in Joyce uh, constructed all of these 70-plus uh, uh, camp cars that were used on, on the railroad. And they consisted also of, of sleeping cars, dormitory cars, shower cars, uh, office cars. Uh, you could have an entire logging camp in, in one of these, as well as uh, some of them were used by Seams Carry Kerbaugh for their offices. Now, the military personnel were in somewhat more informal uh, abodes, and this is one of the many uh, Spruce Division camps that were all over Clallam County, uh, because in addition to the 36-mile railroad that we're talking about today, uh, there were also Spruce Division associated with Maryland Ring and Snow Creek Logging, and, and uh, a number of the other companies had 
uh, subrusive agent personnel assigned to them. Um, to the right hand side here would have been the uh, enlisted men's uh, porters. Uh, on the left here in, in uh, the extreme left, the large building would have been the, the mess hall and, and kitchen and the three tents, um, just this side of, of the mess hall were probably the officer's quarters as well as the officer's office. Now, it's said that an army marches on its stomach, and, and that was certainly very true of the Spruce Division. Uh, the mess hall at, at uh, Lake Pleasant uh, was uh, large enough that they could, uh, at a sitting, could, could uh, feed up to about 1,300 people in shifts. You will, if you want to count the, the uh, people in this photograph, there's, there's more than 200 that, are, that can easily be counted in, in this. You'll notice that the tableware is all uh, military uh, porcelain or um, uh, tableware. And, and the table is fully set with, with coffee and water and generally milk as, as well. The personnel took their morning and evening meals in the mess hall at the, at the camps. And the noon meal was generally brought out to them uh, in the woods, or they would take it in the morning uh, in, in a nose bag or a, or a uh, lunchbox uh, out to wherever they were working and, and eat it in the field. To get materiel to the west end of the county, uh, there were a whole series of, of convoys that, that moved constantly between the Lake Pleasant area and, and Port Angeles, which was, uh, or Joyce, uh, where the railhead and, and uh, uh, everybody was was piled on trucks and, and uh, together with uh, their beds and everything else that they would need, uh, including the kitchen sink and, and trucked out to the West End. Uh, you'll notice on on this truck how everybody has their seat belt and and shoulder harness uh, clicked. Um, and you'll also notice that the the uh, license plate on the truck says Signal Corps of, of the U.S. Army. Uh, during the the conflict during the First World War, uh, there was a great attitude among the the uh, military men that the only thing that an airplane was going to be good for uh, was to replace carrier pigeons uh, or possibly some reconnaissance. And so the Spruce Division was a a, a portion of the U.S. Army uh, Signal Corps. This is where they were headed with the railroad, uh, with the mainline railroad anyhow, 36 miles of it. Uh, this was Lake Pleasant in, in 1918. And it was originally going to be this, the site of a uh, pre-cut mill where they would have brought the logs in from the logging lines, pre-cut them into cans before they sent them into Port Angeles for ultimately being machined into uh, aircraft lumber. They did, in fact, build a mill on, on uh, Lake Pleasant, uh, and this is a, a photograph of it. And in addition to the mill, there were also significant barracks that were built out there, as well as a, uh, a tent city uh, for the Seams Carry uh, people. Uh, the uh, I was out to Lake Pleasant several years ago and, and uh, was looking with this photograph, trying to, to decide where it was. And a gentleman walked up to me and, and said, uh, well, what you, what you looking for? And I said, well, this mill. He uh, dragged me off into the brush. And, and sure enough, there was still the, the concrete uh, from the foundation for the main mill engine uh, that had uh, in fact built this uh, th that they had built uh, when they uh, when they constructed this mill. There's also some piling that you can see uh, that are off off to the right of this photograph. In Port Angeles, the they built this uh, large mill. It's on the site of uh, where the Rainier 
uh, mill was. Um, it was uh, one of two identical mills. The other one was built in Toledo, Oregon. Um, and, and this one uh, uh, was uh, going to be one of the, the largest uh, spruce mills, uh, uh, certainly in the world, uh, this one in the Toledo. Um, it was built by personnel that were housed in a series of barracks uh, where kind of the parking lot is uh, or was for, for Rainier, just up Ennis Creek for a while. The other uh, contingent of, of people who were involved in the construction of the mill were, were housed in uh, what was the Olympic Hotel. Uh, it later became um, a hospital here in Port Angeles, and then later the YMCA, and then that's the location of it is, is where the current, current Y is. There was an interesting comment made at the close of the Spruce Division uh, in 1918, and they, somebody who said uh, that it was a shame that such a, a grand scheme never cut even a single piece of airplane spruce. The armistice was signed on November the 11th, of 1918, and all work immediately ceased on the mill as well as on the railroad. Uh, it later was completed uh, by about February of 1919, and they attempted to sell it uh, immediately uh, and found no, no takers. Uh, in 1922, it was sold to the Lion Hill Company that bought the mill the hotel and the railroad uh, as a common carrier railroad. And they operated it for several years and it was sold then to a uh, sold up investment company uh, that operated it as the Port Angeles Western until uh, early 1950s when, uh, when it went out of business and, and was removed. And that ladies and gentlemen is about all I can tell you about the Spruce Production Railroad in Clallam County. Thank you very much.